Welcome to the Droma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Welcome to the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association or JOMA podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Minkin. I'm a general pediatrician and a proud JOMA member. And I'm really honored and really excited to be interviewing another proud JOMA member, Dr. Tal Weinberger. Before I introduce Dr. Weinberger, I am going to say, as I always do, that I love it when people ask to be interviewed by me. I love it when people have something that they're particularly passionate about or topics that I haven't yet addressed or addressed um, completely. Um, The topic we're going to talk about tonight is the use of psychiatric medication for mental health issues. Um, I realized that I haven't actually done this, even though I've been doing so many topics related to mental health. So if you scroll back, you will see that I've done many topics related to this, including a number on postpartum and perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, I interviewed the founder of Cheskenu, the founder of Catch Support. Um, I spoke about these disorders with several um, physicians and therapists. So scroll back to look at that. We didn't go into as much detail because I didn't want to duplicate all the other podcast episodes, um, but I really did want to address the issues surrounding psychiatric medications, um, which have unfortunately been associated with um, unnecessary, I believe, stigma um, and shame and really needed to be addressed. So I'm very honored and very excited to be able to interview Dr. Weinberger. Dr. Weinberger is a clinical associate professor and outpatient medical director for the Department of Psychiatry at the Sidney Kimmel Medical College of Tom- at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She also maintains a secondary faculty appointment in the Department of OBGYN. She completed her undergraduate studies, cum laude, at Yale University and attended medical school at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. She completed her psychiatry residency at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and a fellowship in cognitive behavioral therapy at the Center for Cognitive Therapy in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. She is founding director of the Jefferson Psychopharmacology Specialty Services, a specialized outpatient clinic which provides supervision, teaching, and clinical care in the psychiatry department. She volunteers as a consultant for the perinatal psychiatry consultation line for postpartum support international, providing phone consultation to providers about questions regarding perinatal psychopharmacology. She lectures and has several publications within the field of women's mental health. Welcome, Dr. Weinberger. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for inviting me. No, I really, really appreciate it. So as we discussed before, I have done so many mental health topics. And not only have I done mental health topics, but I've done a lot on um, anxiety, depression, particularly in the um, perinatal um, area, which is your specialty. And we're going to talk about that from from your perspective. Um, But I didn't realize until recently that I have never covered psychiatric medications. I have never interviewed a psychiatrist about psychiatric medications. And it wasn't until I heard the Instagram influencer, Barry Mitzman, who I also did interview at one point, um, I think it's called, but you look amazing, um, about her struggles with both her mental and physical health. And she put it on Instagram. She says, you know, I'm back on my psychiatric medications and I feel like myself again. And I was like, wow, like I, I really need to cover this. You know, I don't want to be giving the, the misimpression that um, somehow there is something less um, or wrong about psychiatric medications. And in fact, we're, we're going against a major stigma right now. I feel like we're making great inroads into fighting the stigma of talking about mental health disorders, about having them, about therapy. I mean, I think therapy is, is practically cool now, um, but that's not true for the medication, right? No, definitely not. Good for Barry Missman. I think like, I mean, she's, she's clearly made a huge impact um, by, you know, that, you know, incredibly brave self-disclosure. It really is. And just today, I happen to have listened to the latest episode as of this week, which is the week of June 1st, um, the Francisca 
podcast. I don't know if you've ever listened to that podcast. Excellent. Um, and this one was on mental health and family planning. And the person interviewed wow. having significant mental health struggles. She's anonymous in the this particular episode. She's it's very explicit and, and it um, contains a lot of sensitive um, topics. But it's incredible how she was talking about how she and her husband are waiting to have kids as she deals with her mental health, which they are prioritizing. Yeah, no, that's that's really that's really that's really really tough. Um, and you know, that's that's what I that's what I manage like every day and help try to help people with. Yes, and you know, we, we are going to talk about the the um, area surrounding um, having kids. Um, after 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 having kids, nursing, you know that whole is a very super sensitive period that you you specialize in. So that's that we really need to talk about that. But first, we just need to start with just the basic topic of psychiatric medication. I would focus more on the what I call the garden variety anxiety and depression, which right. as a pediatrician, it's incredibly prevalent right now. It's incredibly common in teenagers. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'd like you to just start with who needs medication? Not everybody with mental health problems needs to be on medication. Right. No, absolutely not. And I, again, I think, you know, focusing narrowly on anxiety and depression, right, as opposed to kind of other areas of mental health, such as bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia, mm-hmm. the, you know, the answers would be very, very, very different if we were talking about, um, about, about those illnesses. But so focusing specifically on anxiety and depression, um, it, it's, it's, I think it's, it's really, really tough for people to kind of conceptualize anxiety, depression as an illness in the same way as they think about other medical illnesses for really good reason. Um, other, you know, I think to start out with, right. Um, Anxiety and sadness really exist on a continuum with normal in a way that other symptoms don't, right? So there are times where it's absolutely normal and appropriate to be sad, even very, very sad. There are times where it's absolutely normal and appropriate to be anxious, even very, very anxious. And we wouldn't want people, you know, not to feel those emotions in those situations. Those are normal emotions that it would be, you know, abnormal if, you know, under kind of normal circumstances, people weren't experiencing those emotions. That's not, you know, really true in the same way for physical symptoms, really. Like, you know, when somebody has a physical symptom, you know, it may or may not be, you know, serious or not serious or something that you need to do something about or not. But um, it's hard to imagine a situation where somebody's having pain or some other like physical symptom where we would sort of say, this is, this is good. Like this is normal. Um, and, and so it, it can be hard to sort of distinguish between what's normal and what's really pathological, especially in cases where, you know, where it's subtle. So, you know, sort of the guiding principles that, um, that we, that, that we use really in thinking about anxiety and depression um, are really sort of the pervasiveness of the symptoms and like the persistence of the symptoms. So in other words, somebody who is sad because something really difficult has happened in their life, even, you know, really grieving a very, very serious loss, um, you know, it, 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 that's, that's something that's gonna, you know, not necessarily improve in a linear manner, may get better and worse and may take a very, very long time, but will gradually improve with time. People who are sad about something that's stressful in their life are, for the most part, able to still enjoy other things in their life and think about other things in their life and have times where they feel happy. That's not the case for somebody who really has depression. Somebody who has depression is really going to feel sad, like almost all the time, sort of no matter what. And there's very, very little that can actually make them happy. Um, People with depression are sad, you know, kind of in a, in a persistent way for over the course of, you know, weeks or potentially even, you know, months or sometimes even years. Um, Often um, it's associated, so people with depression aren't just sad. Um, Often it's associated with other symptoms, such as difficulty with sleep or difficulty with appetite. People will often, you know, not feel hungry, um, low energy. They just won't, people will feel like really unmotivated, like just disinterested, things that used to bring them joy, just don't bring them joy anymore. And it's sort of a whole kind of spectrum of symptoms that we would call 
depression. Um, you know, similarly for anxiety, we really want to think about, you know, I think, again, sort of symptoms that are more persistent and pervasive, right? People with, you know, normal anxiety feel anxious when something stressful happens, but generally when that, you know, stressful event resolves, the anxiety will resolve with time. Um and but people with with an anxiety disorder will feel anxious, you know, most of the time about something. And there can be a stressor, right? Often people with anxiety disorders will say, well, you know, look at all these, you know, stressful things that are happening in my life. Um, I, you know, it makes sense that I'm anxious. But the thing is that people with an anxiety disorder will generally almost always have something that's making them anxious. Like if it's not one thing, it's another thing. Um, and um, um, also often will, you know, will develop a pattern where they will avoid the things that they're, that they're, that they have anxiety about um, in order to, you know, to avoid feeling the feelings of, of, of anxiety that, you know, that go along with that, with that experience. Um, so, when somebody has sort of that, like that syndrome, that combination of symptoms, those would be times that we would consider medication. It wouldn't necessarily be the only thing that we would consider, but in those situations, medication should certainly be on the menu. And sort of depending on the severity of the symptoms, we would, you know, kind of advocate for the use of medication more or less strongly. You know, somebody with mild symptoms who wants to kind of try other options you know, I would sort of be more inclined to, you know, support that than somebody really with very, very severe symptoms. Right. So it's on a spectrum so that the people at the most severe end, quite possibly from the very, you know, onset of symptoms might really need medication and people who are at the milder end might still, depending on, you know, mild is in the eye of the beholder, right? Right. Might still choose medication over Correct. other options, but might respond to other options. Right, right, right. So I would, I would see it. Mm. You know, with um, with milder symptoms, I would see it more as a matter of choice. Mm -hmm. You know, and obviously, it's always choice. Obviously, the right. patient always can say no to what you're recommending. But I would make a much stronger recommendation in the case of you know more severe disabling symptoms. Right, and we say disabling is really how much it's impacting how you function in your day to day life. Right. Right, right. And absolutely, you know, I think it's a really, really good point. Absolutely, you know, people with mild symptoms can be on medication and, you know, I would encourage it, honestly, in many cases, um, uh, you know, I think it, it, it's absolutely, it's absolutely warranted in many cases, you know, even with mild symptoms, but that would sort of be a situation where I think if somebody really had a strong preference one way or another, we might, you know, sort of be more inclined to kind of take that into account. Mm -hmm. What about the role of therapy? The, okay, so therapy therapy is 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 can play a, a huge role. Therapy is an incredibly effective intervention for both anxiety and depression. Um, there are some specific therapies that have really been studied in the same way as we study medications in terms of you know evaluating their efficacy um, and have been shown to be really really very very effective in the treatment of anxiety and depression. Um, and um, therapy, you know, if somebody I will often, I will often recommend therapy along with medication. Um, I will occasionally recommend therapy without medication. I will occasionally recommend medication without therapy, sort of depending on the circumstances. Um, but, you know, if somebody really feels very strongly opposed to medication for whatever reason, I think therapy in most cases would be kind of what I would recommend that they try next because it really is a very, very effective intervention for, for depression and anxiety. Right. And, and when you say therapy, there are so many different kinds of therapy. Correct. Yeah. Right. No, there are many, many, many different kinds of therapy. And some of them are more well studied in anxiety and depression than others. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is one form of therapy. It's certainly not the only one, but is one form of therapy that's very, very well studied in anxiety and depression. Um, actually, you know, the um, the founder of cognitive behavioral therapy, Aaron Beck, was really the person who kind of pioneered the the um, the study of therapy in the same way as medications are studied, like. Um, you're comparing therapy in sort of um, 
clinical trials to, you know, to placebo interventions, which are, you know, kind of beyond the scope of, of this um, talk kind of what that would look like. But, um, but th- there are, there are many, many, many studies of cognitive behavioral therapy and other forms of therapy have followed and have also done, you know, rigorous scientific studies on their efficacy, but there's, there's really quite a bit of data on cognitive behavioral therapy in terms of being really, really quite helpful for depression and anxiety. Right. That being said that everybody's different, right? And the underlying cause of the anxiety, depression, or the comorbidities, things associated with it may mean that that particular form of therapy might not be right for a specific person, correct? Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, there, there are always individual factors that we would consider, you know, in terms of thinking about whether we would recommend a combination of medication and therapy versus just one or the other. Um, Our best outcomes, you know, in, 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 in the data that we have, the best outcomes we see is, is with a combination of both. Um, but there are certainly, you know, reasons why somebody might not be a good candidate for therapy or might, you know, might not be a good candidate for medication. Um, or um, although, well, th- certainly um, I, I, there are different pros and cons to medications versus therapy that may you know, or may not work for different people, for example, right? Therapy is really time consuming. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, you know, can be expensive. And there's really a, like a dearth of really good therapy providers out there. Um, And so, you know, it it certainly happened on many occasions that, you know, that I've had patients say to me, you know, like, I really would love to do therapy, but like, it's just not like I can't, like I, you know, I have a busy life and I have a family and like, there's just no time in my day for it. Um, and that's legitimate. Like, that's not a, you know, I think, you know, that's, that's not, that's not them running away from their problems. Um, that's a legitimate obstacle to that, you know, modality of treatment. Right. It's so interesting. You just said running away from your problems. I think this is a problem we have. I don't know if it's particular to Americans and our attitude of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. Why do we treat that? No one says, oh, why are you taking that antibiotic, you know, for your strep? <laughs> You, know, you have strep, you're taking an antibiotic or a sinus infection to be a little bit, you know, give a little bit better example, because some people will choose for a sinus infection relatively on the milder end, right, to not take antibiotics and to, you know, do a lot of saline and whatever. Why do we judge this? Why is this moral judgment coming from? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's And it's something I've certainly grappled with. I mean, I think some of it is, you know, kind of what I talked about earlier, that like, it's really tough to sort of make subtle distinctions between what's normal and what's pathological. And I think especially for like, the person who's suffering, you know, they're feeling the feelings that they're feeling, and they feel like their feelings, right? And right. they are their feelings, and they feel normal to them. And, you know, to them, it's it's really kind of hard to wrap their mind around the idea that this could be an illness. Now, what I've seen, you know, probably hundreds of times is, you know, it, with that exact patient, when they're successfully treated, they'll look back and reflect upon, you know, what they were experiencing before and say, oh my goodness, like I was suffering so much. I didn't even realize, I didn't realize how anxious I was. I didn't realize how depressed I was. Um, but you know, but it's kind of, it's very, very hard to have perspective on that when, right. when, when you're in it. Um, you know, I think the other thing that, you know, that I see a lot um, is that um, some of the like sort of more typical thought distortions that we see going along with depression or anxiety sort of dovetail with an anti-medication bias. Um, mm-hmm. For example, right, you know, and this is my residents will tell you, this is a conversation I have with, you know, with my patients over and over and over again, the concept of anxiety interfering with the treatment of anxiety. So people who um, are anxious are anxious. They're anxious about lots of different things. They're anxious about all sorts of things in their life. And so they're also anxious about taking medication. And often people with anxiety, you know, when the conversation about medication comes up, they are very, very concerned about all the potential bad things could happen that could happen to them if they take medications. And that often is, you know, is, is distorted. Uh, one of my former supervisors said something very, very smart, which is um, going to try to make sure I get this right. Um, that people with anxiety often will um, 
will overestimate the impact of errors of commission and underestimate the mm. impact of errors of omission, right? So they're they're thinking very much about like, well, you know, what if like 17 catastrophic things happen if they take this medication, but they're not necessarily thinking through what the impact of their untreated illness is on right. themselves and the people around them. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, 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 a uh, that's, that it's a hard, but a rewarding conversation to have because, you know, it's an obstacle to treatment. That's a function of the illness really itself. Right. And we haven't gotten to that, you know, side effects of medication. It's very understandable for somebody to say, I don't like the way medication makes me feel. Absolutely. But we're not really talking about that. We're talking about having an anti-medication bias. And that leads me to talking about people who say, well, I'd rather try anything other than medication. How about um, this alternative therapy or, or that alternative therapy, or even just trying to eat healthier, sleep more, exercise more? Right. No, and I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. I didn't mean people who took medications who experienced side effects right. that were unpleasant. That's a different, yeah, yeah. that's certainly a different issue that's right. worthy of discussion. Right. Um, often people will not even want to try medications because they will have done, you know, a Google search and found all sorts of, you know, horrific things that are not accurate um, that, you know, that scare them in terms of the possible side effects of medication. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I think that um, so I think another um, another kind of distortion that does tells with with some of the things that people struggle with is sort of the idea that like this is this is my fault, or if only I were better, or if only I tried harder, right. you know, everybody else can do this, and why can't I? And I, I'm just not trying hard enough. Right. Um, and that's that's, again, sort of a, a thought process that um, a lot of people can have, but certainly people with depression, I think, are quite prone to have. Um, and and I think that, you know. People, you know. Well-meaning people in, you know, in people's lives who have anxiety and depression may, again, sort of not understand that and sort of, you know, not having had the experience themselves, just be able to say, well, you know, I can sort of just, you know, like push through, I can't, yeah, yeah. they can't, right, they can't necessarily sort of relate to the fact that, you know, that this, this is, you know, that this person has really been trying very, 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 very hard, and they just, they, they need more help. Right, it's also an invisible disorder. That's definitely true, too. Right? I mean, these are things going on inside someone. No, that's a really good point. Yeah. But I still want to go a little bit more about these more of an alternative or a natural approach, because I, I do believe in integrating all different aspects of wellness into mental health. I think that diet, exercise, and sleep are super, super important. A hundred percent. But when it's a, you know approached as, oh, you don't need medication, you need to try this diet, or this natural approach or that kind of thing. And there's endless, you know, right. types of things you can do. Um, and for the, for the person to feel bad, why, why can't I get over this with those approaches? That's right. Cool. Right. No. And I think that that, again, that sort of dovetails with, you know, the excessive guilt that people feel right. when they're depressed, which is, you know, Oh my goodness. Like all these people are telling me that, and, you know, that these things work for them and they don't work for me. And what's wrong with me? This is kind of more evidence that I'm defective or damaged in some way, um, which is, again, I totally agree with you, which is not to say that people shouldn't try those things. Right. You know, certainly um, sleep is incredibly important. Regular sleep is incredibly important. We, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of evidence that sleep and depression are, you know, kind of intertwined in a bidirectional way that people who have problems with sleep are, are more likely to develop depression and kind of vice versa. Um, you know, exercise, you know, there certainly is um, evidence that exercise can be, uh, you know, helpful for depression. Um, it, yoga, there's some, there's some, there's some data on yoga. Um, there, um, you know, certainly there are things that people, you know, can try in the setting of sort of more mild symptoms and should try probably. Mm -hmm. um, but, 
I think what 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 happens unfortunately is you know it works for some people and that's great mm. you know you don't ever need to see me if it works for you that's that's awesome um but for people for whom it doesn't work you know they're sort of left with uh like you know this didn't work i look look how hard i'm trying you know and you know this is sort of more evidence of how right. you know it, how bad i am it must be um, my fault i must right. be doing it wrong because like you never hear from all of these you know, amazing glowing reviews, the reviews of the people who it didn't work for. Right, exactly. The other thing that I think, you know, the other air, um, the other thing that I think it's important to keep in mind for that is that sometimes, right, again, we're talking about mild symptoms, but sometimes when symptoms are really more severe, they can really interfere with people's ability to do those things. I cannot right. tell you how many times I've had referrals from therapists who have, you know, been excellent therapists and who have been working with patients who are really good therapy candidates, but they're just too depressed to really like click with the therapy to really, you know, to use the therapy in any kind of meaningful way, or they're just too overwhelmingly anxious in order to be able to right. use the therapy in any kind of meaningful way. They need the volume turned down on right. like the severity of those symptoms before they can access the therapy. Um, and that's really where we see, you know, medication and therapy work you know, really, really well together is when we can kind of turn the volume of symptoms down sufficiently so that, you know, the person is then, you know, kind of able to kind of have their wits about them enough to really engage in therapy and use it well. Right. That's really, really true. Um, you don't have to go to therapy, fail therapy, and then go on medication. Right. 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 And I do right. see some some categories of, of the patients I see who have more of a social anxiety who don't even want to step foot in a therapist's office and really would prefer to start medication. And maybe the symptoms would be perceived by, you know, someone else is milder, but they need help to function. Yeah, no, that's a great Not example. Right? That's something, to yeah, we need to turn the volume down on the symptoms right. before they can even really engage in a health treatment exercise is the same right i mean you can tell somebody to exercise until you're blue in the face and you can blame them for not exercising but if they just can't get out of bed like they can't really exercise like they can't really utilize that you know that good advice in any kind of meaningful way whereas you know again once you've sort of turned the volume down on their symptoms somewhat they can then sort of integrate some of those positive lifestyle changes in their life which can help in their recovery Right. And putting aside those who are, you know, too much in distress to exercise, even those who do exercise, who think, okay, well, I'm exercising. I heard this statistic that exercise is just as good as an SSRI for depression yeah. and anxiety. Is that true even? Well, no. I, I mean, so there are, there are some studies that indicate that, you know, that it, that it is helpful as helpful as an SSRI for mild depression. There are other studies that indicate the opposite. Um, and I think we see that, right? I mean, I think, you know, we see that out in the world um, it, that for some people it's really helpful and for some people it, it's just not really helpful at all. You know, even, right, I mean, you're right. There's two issues. There's like, can you exercise, right? Are you right. too depressed to exercise? And then right. there's the, if you do exercise, will it work? And, you know, for some people it does and for some people it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then, you know, at some point we need to kind of call it and say, this isn't working. Let's move on to something else. Right. I mean, again, in my dream world, it would be all integrated. It wouldn't be that you'd have to pick. You could do things at the same time and not say, okay, well, I'm going to do this, you know, natural approach or this diet exercise, you know, um, sleep approach. You would just be doing everything together. You'd go from specialist to specialist in the same clinic day and you get everything and you wouldn't, you'd have it all together. Cause I think that everything integrates together and it isn't just one thing. I think that people will say, well, I don't think I should just be taking medication and, and masking right things. Have you heard people say that? A hundred percent. Yeah. That's, that's, I'm really glad you brought that up because that's a, that's a, that's another, that's a really unfortunate misconception that I mm -hmm. think really feeds into stigma and to people feeling kind of worse about themselves when they're in a position where, you know, medication does seem like a good option for them. Um, it's just, that's just not accurate. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a bias against medication that really has no founding and, you know, in, in, in data or in reality. Um, we, you know, 
we use medications to treat anxiety and depression in the same way as any other medical specialist uses medications to treat other illnesses, right? You know, and it's very rare, you know, other than giving somebody an antibiotic and having their sinus infection go away, right? Pretty much every medication that we use is not curative, right? Like most medications that we use are medications that need to be maintained in some manner or something needs to be maintained in some manner to manage the illness, you know, once the medication is, you know, is, is, is stopped. Um, antidepressants treat depression. Depression is an illness that, you know, when people have depression and they take an antidepressant and the antidepressant works, you know, which is, our best case scenario, and which often, you know, is, is the result that we, that we achieve, um, you know, the person will often look back and say, you know, I wasn't myself before. Like I, the depression was getting in the way of me being the person I am, who I am. I am who I am now, right? Mm -hmm. It removes the symptoms of the illness so that the person can be the person that they are. It's not a happy pill. It's not like meant to blunt your emotions. That's not what we're trying to do. We're, we're treating illness so that the person can be the person that they were before the illness. All right. I think all these things are true, but I'm going to go back to that word masking I used. Um, I'm going to be a little bit of a devil's advocate here because I do think there's awesome. a to say that you can have symptoms of depression. They can be associated with a chronic illness, for example. So just treating the depression would not treat the illness, which may or may not be undiagnosed. Or for example, you could be eating certain foods that are making you feel worse. If you changed your diet, you would feel better. So instead of thinking in my mind, instead of thinking, well, I'm going to just keep trying everything other than medication, why not do everything at the same time? Do you know what I'm saying? No, I I 100% agree with you. I mean, I think a little bit maybe to just sort of make a distinction again between depression and distress, right? Like Mm -hmm. there's, we're not aware of any food that causes depression. Certainly there are foods that certain people don't tolerate well and cause, you know, all sorts of symptoms and they feel better, you know, without those foods. Um, I'm not aware of any food that causes depression. And so I would sort of make that distinction. Um, With illness, chronic illness is a little bit different, right? I think you can have two different scenarios there. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, you can have somebody who is really just upset and demoralized because, you know, because they're sick and that makes a whole lot of sense. And then, yeah, you're right. Giving them an antidepressant is really probably not going to do all that much of anything um, because we haven't, you know, addressed the root issue. However, there are people for whom both is true, you know, for whom that from they, they're struggling with a, you know, with, you know, with a real stressor, chronic illness or whatever, what have you. Um, and they also, you know, on top of that, tr- certainly triggered by the, you know, by the illness, but they do develop a syndrome consistent with depression. And when we give those people an antidepressant, they cope with the stressors in their life much, much better than they did before. They're, they're not happy about them, right? It's still hard. Um, but they're able to sort of manage and compartment, well, not even that compartmentalize is a wrong word. They're able to, you know, manage and cope in a much more constructive way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I mean, I definitely see, I see the role of medication and, and I am very concerned about um, providers. I'm going to use the word provider for a minute who are pushing the narrative of if you just ate better, if you just you know, did this or that natural vitamin or potion or whatever, then you will not need medication. I think that it does feed into the stigma and the shame for medication. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And look, you know, if you've changed your diet and you feel better, that's great. You don't need any, you know, if you're taking a supplement that makes you feel great, then that's wonderful. Please, you know, as long as it's safe, Um, please continue that supplement. You don't need me. That's not the situation that we're talking about. We're talking about the situation, which I see all the time and sounds like you see as well, um, (laughs) where somebody, you know, has been told like, if only you just did this thing, you'd feel better. And they do the thing and they don't feel better. Um, And then it's sort of a double whammy because they don't feel better. And then they feel guilty. They don't feel better. Right. And they might just spend a lot of money. And they might have spent a lot of money. Exactly. <laughs> I was 
<laughs> so I actually want to, um, you know what? I want to go a little bit more still on the basics. Um, so if someone's on medication, does that mean they're going to be on it for life? Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. And there are a lot of factors that go into determining how long somebody needs to be on a medication. Um, some of the more important ones, um, and we have sort of more data on this in de the depression literature than the anxiety literature, although we you know, tend to use the same principles to kind of guide our decision-making process. Um, is, you know, is how many episodes a person's had, right? So somebody who's had one episode of depression, say, for example, in the context of a very specific stressor that's now gone away, is very different from somebody who's kind of had recurrent episodes of depression throughout their life. Um, somebody who's had one episode, you know, that conversation about coming off a of medication is very different than somebody who's had, you know, recurrent episodes throughout their life. Generally, somebody who's had three or more episodes is probably somebody who should continue their medication indefinitely in some form or another, um, because they're very, 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 very high risk for relapse. Um, somebody who's had one episode, you know, who um, wants to come off their medication and whose life circumstances are different, or I think the other really important factor that, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, we mention straight out is therapy, right? So, the data on um, medication, you know, versus therapy is that, you know, medication is quicker, um, as we would expect, but therapy, you know, when, when therapy is done successfully, the benef benefits of therapy are, are longer lasting. So in other words, people who do therapy successfully and then stop therapy stay well longer than people who do medication successfully and stop medication. So if somebody who, you know, has had a successful course of therapy um, you know, has, you know, had one episode, um, their life circumstances are different. They're thinking about the world differently. That's somebody who I think could be a reasonable candidate to stop their medication. They don't have to stop their medication. You know, I've certainly had people in that circumstance say, I feel so much better. I feel like myself. I've never like, you know, I've never known what it was like to live right. sort of unencumbered by depression or anxiety. Um, and now I do, and I don't want to, you know, it's just not okay. worth it. It's right. not worth risking it. I want to stay on this medication. And that's a very reasonable decision. I think other people in that situation would say, you know, look, I'm really in a very, very different place in my life. Things are very, very different. I want to try to come off this medication and see how I do. And I think that's a reasonable decision as well. Um, you know, other factors that would go into the decision about, you know, when and how to stop a medication would be the like the severity of the episode. Um, you know, if somebody's had a really, really, really severe, severe episode where they were, you know, suicidal or they may have even attempted to harm themselves, you know, that's that's you know, that's that's different. That's sort of a higher risk situation where we would want to kind of think tw you know, twice or three times, um, you know, as opposed to somebody who's had milder symptoms. Also, I think, you know, the strength of a person's support system is really a, is a really, really important factor. Like, do we have other people, you know, in their life that can kind of serve as an early warning signal if they're just learning mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, go downhill and they're maybe not noticing it because often people don't notice it when they're starting to have subtle symptoms. Like, is there somebody who could kind of say, hey, like, I think you, you ought to call your doctor, you know, before things get really, you know, sort of catastrophically bad. Um, and so those would kind of be all the factors I would consider, again, sort of in the case of depression or anxiety, um, other psychiatric conditions are different. Um, but, um, but there, yeah, so there, after, after an episode of depression, like if somebody's had an episode of depression, generally we see the highest risk of relapse within the first year. So if, the, if somebody can maintain their medication for at least a year before kind of even really starting the conversation about coming off of it, you know, some doctors will say six or nine months. I tend to say a year again, because the data is that the highest risk of relapse is in a year within that first year, um, you know. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, unless, you know, the person was really having very difficult side effects or there were other kind of obstacles to treatment, I wouldn't necessarily even want to have that conversation within the first year. But after the first year, you know, kind of we would take those variables into account in considering that decision. Right. And side effects, which I'm not sure we're going to get to, I mean, there are different medications and you can always switch a medication when the side effects are um, not worth it. 
And Correct. And there are other ways of working around the side effects. Mm. Now, that being said, I think an important thing, point to make is that these medications are not interchangeable, right? So um, somebody may respond really, really well to one medication um, mm. and really poorly to another medication in the same class for reasons that we don't understand, but we see it all the time. And so the decision to switch medications is not one that should be made lightly um, because we don't really know what we're going to get either in terms of side effects or right. benefit if we switch. Um, but yes, certainly in principle, you know, I, I meant, you know, I would certainly think about it that way. If somebody is on a medication and they're having side effects that are just really prohibitive, um, you know, the next thing I would think about would be, you know, kind of a, adjusting the dose, or sometimes we can adjust the timing to help with side effects or potentially switching medications. Right. And that's really important because people are not just stopping their medication because of stigma. Right. This is true. They're stopping it because of side effects. It, but for both reasons, that's absolutely right. true. Right. But I think for, for the reason of stigma, I think it's so important. I think it can't be said enough that people should not think um, if I were really good, I could get off this medication because I think people do think that. People do think that. A and they shouldn't. Right. It's normal. Yeah, it's, so that is, that, it's, it's, that's, it's not, it's not correct. I mean, I think it's, right. it's, you know, like the sort of often used analogy of diabetes. It's like saying, right. you know, if only I were better, I could control my blood sugar and not have diabetes. Right. It just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You know, there are some people who are able to control their diabetes through diet and exercise. And there are some people who need medication and it's not, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's a function of, you know, the illness that you, that you have right. um, that sort of determines, you know, kind of what, what treatment you're, you know, that, that, that you're going to, that you're going to need. Right. You, you need what you need. You right. need what you it's need. Really what right. it is. But, but this is a pet peeve that I have. I think there's something in between anti-medication and pro-medication, which is this very subtle, it's really anti-medication light. You know, where they say, mm, it's just a crotch. It's okay to right. use it for a short period of time. Yeah, no, I agree with you. That's very dangerous. It's very right. dangerous and it's not true. Um, and then again, it, you know, I think it's, it's particularly insidious because it sort of like pushes all the buttons of the person right. who's considering taking medication, right? Who's already feeling excessively guilty and excessively anxious about potential problems. Um, and, um, and so now we're sort of, you know, we're, we're reinforcing that even more, um, in a way that's totally, you know, it totally, totally distorted. Um, and it's, you know, and it's just not accurate. Right. So we need to talk about medication during these more sensitive periods, which is your specialty without going into great detail about the <laughs> disorders themselves, because we don't have that sure. much time, but I've done that. People can go back and look. I've done so many episodes um, with the founder of Kazkenu and the founder of Catch Support um, and with Devar Enten um, and Miriam Segura Harrison. So those are four separate podcasts. Um, a lot of them are relating to these particular um, PMADs, right? They're perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Right. So I'm going to let you just go into medication for that because that was the piece that I didn't go into as much. Okay. And some okay. of the issues yeah. that no, come up sure. with, with trying to medicate or not medicate during these very important time periods. Right. So, you know, I think, you know, just to kind of throw out a couple of numbers, um, postpartum depression is incredibly common and, and can be incredibly debilitating. It's the most common complication of childbirth. So, you know, of all medical complications right. of childbirth, postpartum depression is the most common. Um, and, you know, kind of another scary number before I start talking about medications is that, you know, in our first world country, we're, thank God, you know, women die very infrequently in the postpartum period. You know, postpartum death is very, very rare. But amongst the postpartum deaths in this country, 20% of them are suicide. So one fifth of all postpartum deaths are suicide. So that I think just kind of just that's sort of some background in terms of the enormity of the problem. Um, but that's really not, you know, the issue that I like to really focus on with my patients when I talk about medication is that, um, you know, often the conversation about around medication in pregnancy is framed in terms of, 
you know, well, are you choosing to put your baby at risk? And most women, you know, women who are depressed, women who are not depressed will do anything to protect their babies. And so sort of the, you know, kind of the logical response to that, that many people have are no, you know, I, you know, I will suffer, I will suffer to protect my baby, like, that is worth it to me. Um, But that's, that's not an accurate way of framing the issue. And we know that very, very clearly from, you know, a lot of the literature that we've seen over the past couple of decades, which is that we really need to look at postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety to some extent. Postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety um, in the same during pregnancy um, and postpartum, sorry, um, depression during pregnancy and postpartum and anxiety during pregnancy and postpartum, to be clear. Um, we, we need to look at that in the same way as we look at other illnesses during pregnancy and postpartum. So again, to use the kind of old diabetes analogy, right? Like if somebody has diabetes and they're pregnant, we want to use the most, the safest treatment to treat their diabetes, um, obviously, on the one hand. On the other hand, we're not going to just say, well, you know, don't treat the diabetes because untreated diabetes also poses, you know, a tremendous risk to the baby, um, a much more significant risk than the risks of treatment, right? And so when we think about balancing out the risks of treatment versus no treatment, we choose treatment because that's safer for the baby, because the risk of exposure to untreated diabetes is, 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 is dangerous for the baby. We really see that that's really we need to look at depression and anxiety in the same way. There's a lot of literature that shows really very, very clear um, negative developmental effects on the baby due to exposure to depression and anxiety during pregnancy and postpartum. And so in many ways, that's like liberating for a lot of women because it's not like they have, like they're told like, okay, well, you have to choose between you and your baby. That's, it's not true. It's not accurate. And it's not fair. Honestly, Um, In many cases, the safer decision, the better way to protect the baby is actually to treat because exposing the baby to untreated illness is not benign. I I think it's it's important to understand that there's no risk-free option here. Correct. I hate to say vaccinations and bring up vaccinations in this conversation. That's hurt me so far, but it's a similar kind of decision-making. Absolutely. Not not to value errors of omission, commission over errors of omission, right? Right, exactly. Something happens exactly. when you did something, somehow that's worse than when you did nothing. Correct. Yeah, vaccination is a great analogy, actually. Weighing, yeah. I'm sorry for bringing it up. No, I love it. <laughs> it's just a trigger for me. <laughs> okay, so let's go, let's go a little deeper on this. Um, we talked about why it's important to consider medication and why the risks of not medicating um, can be greater. Are there certain medications um, that we know to be safe? How do we know how safe they are? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So most, almost all of the medications that we use to treat depression and anxiety are medications that have been studied very, very, very extensively and where we have a lot of really, really reassuring safety data. We feel very, very, very comfortable using, you know, almost everything that we would use to treat to treat depression and anxiety in a non-pregnant woman in a pregnant woman. Again, we're talking about depression and anxiety. We're not talking about, you know, other conditions like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Um, but, you know, medications, specifically kind of the longer term medications used to treat depression and anxiety, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors um, and the serotonin nor- norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, the, you know, the older ones, we, you know, we feel very, very comfortable using them in pregnancy. Now, the really like the newer medications, the ones that like just came out a couple of years ago, we, we don't know that they're not safe, but we really don't have enough data. So, you know, the, to, to feel convinced that they are safe. And so those were, were, those are medications that I would be less likely to use. You know, again, you know, if you have a woman who's done really, really, really well on one of the newer medications, like for example, belazodone, I have a, a patient who's on belazodone. Um, who's trying to get pregnant. And that's really the only, only medication that she's done well with. And then that, you know, kind of becomes a risk benefit decision where we really, you know, we don't know anything negative about it, but, um, but we just don't have a lot of data to suggest it's safe, but the older medications like uh, Prozac, Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro, Effexor, Cymbalta, those are all medications that we feel very, very comfortable using. 
The one exception is Paxil or Paroxetine, and that's a medication where there is some data associating it with um, heart defects. Um, there's also data that suggests that that data is not accurate. Um, mm -hmm. And so we don't, we don't really know. Um, that's a medication that again, you know, I would certainly feel comfortable using in somebody that, you know, has not responded to other medications and really has only responded to that medication, but it wouldn't necessarily be my first choice. Um, but really, you know, the safest medication in pregnancy is the one that works, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's sort of my, my guiding principle. Um, because, you know, if we start, switching people to medications that we, you know, think are safer, which is not necessarily the case. Cause again, really, really, we have more than enough reassuring safety data on, you know, most of the medications we use. If we try to switch, um, then we risk having the woman relapse, which then is exposing the baby both to medication and to untreated illness. And so we kind of have the worst of both worlds. Right. I want to take a step back, though, and say that um, the Francisca show podcast that I mentioned earlier um, talks about when someone is struggling with their mental health to the point that they are really not ready to go through pregnancy and having children. And that's a separate whole that's a great point. conversation, but people who are interested can listen to that talk. And she talks a lot about, again, we are not here at Apaskan Halacha. We're not going to mention it at all. Um, but she does talk about how she, you know, she did get a Hector, she did go to a Rav um, every step of the way, and people should not underestimate. That's a great point. You know, yeah. we really like to see people stable before they start to try to get pregnant for lots of reasons, right? right. For the reasons right, right. that you mentioned, which is that, you know, people understandably and, you know, shouldn't feel equipped to manage a pregnancy when they're struggling that much. That's, you know, completely, completely um, accepted. Um, but then sort of the other factors in addition to that are that we don't want to be kind of messing with some of these medications during pregnancy. Like we want them to be going into pregnancy on a medication that works so that we're, again, not exposing the baby to untreated illness and we're not exposing the baby to multiple medications as we're trying to get it right. So, you know, ideally we want somebody really rock solid, stable for like, right. you know, a decent period of time before they even try to get pregnant. Right. Do people say to you that they're worried about being on medication, particularly in the first trimester? Is that a concern people have? So you, people certainly say that. Um, first trimester issues are really where we have, you know, like a ton of data. And these medications are, you know, probably among the best studied medications in pregnancy that, that there are. Uh, oh, that's there's tons and tons and tons and tons of data um, on these medications in the first trimester. And then just, you know, to, to make sure we're being clear, uh, the reason why we're focused on the first trimester specifically is that's when all organ formation really happens. And so all sorts of like major malformations are first trimester effects, right? So that's kind of what, why we worry about the, fact for the first trimester so much. Um, and um, it really seems very, very clear that there's no consistent pattern of malformations attributable to the, um, the antidepressants that we use. Um, that's not to say that there aren't some studies that raise concern, there are, but there's a ton of data out there. Most of it is reassuring. We don't really see anything consistent. Um, I think the other important thing to kind of keep in mind, and this is also something I've, you know, discussed with all my patients, is that the way that we study medications in pregnancy is by its nature imperfect, right? We're, we're kind of looking back at people who've chosen to be on medication, who have chosen not to be on medication, right? So these are people who have depression or have anxiety who are taking medication. So when we're looking at effects of medication exposure, we're also, by definition, looking at effects of exposure to depression and anxiety during pregnancy. And a lot of the things that people really were very concerned about in terms of medication effects, once you kind of subtract that variable, once we control for the fact that we're also studying effects of exposure to depression and anxiety in addition to exposure to medication, the medication effects become either go away or become minimal. Oh, wow. um, yeah. So for example, um, you know, it, it, for example, like there was a lot of concern um, 
there was a lot of concern in the popular press, I think, you know, a number of years ago, and people still do express concerns about this, about autism, about antidepressants possibly causing autism. And, you know, the, the concern was 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 legitimate. There were some studies that were really, really quite concerning where we saw that um, children with autism, when we compared them to children without autism, the children with autism were much more likely to have been exposed to antidepressants during pregnancy. And so that made everybody draw the conclusion, oh my goodness, antidepressants cause autism. But again, correlation is not causation. <laughs> correct. That's what we learned the first week in medical school. Correlation is not causation. There, right. There are, there are lots of other, uh, there are other factors. factors associated yeah. with depression that, you know, once we control for them, we see that those are in fact what is responsible for the association with autism rather than the medication. And that when you, you know, when you take away sort of that factor, it's really the depression that's associated with the risk of autism rather than the treatment that's associated. Right. And there's, there's a genetic, there's a genetic correlation, right? There is a genetic okay. correlation. Exactly. Children with exactly. autism are more likely to have parents on the depression anxiety spectrum. Correct. 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 And that's, yeah. Right. So that's thought to be a big part of the, of the connection. Right. Right. But it's so easy because people are, are, are looking right. They're looking to blame the medication and, and right. You know, right. for answers and things that they can do to control Things, which is, is, is so understandable. Correct. It really, really is. But like getting just back to the first trimester, just for a second, yes. like the studies that do raise concerns, again, when we, when we control for this, what we factor, we call it compounding by indication, right? Like mm -hmm. the fact that we're studying the illness as well as the treatment, those effects become much, 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 much diminished. And again, most studies really show, you know, no concerning effects at all. And so we, we really feel very comfortable telling our patients that these medications do not cause major malformations and are not a first trimester risk. Again, with a possible exception of Paxil. Right, right. This is so good to know. What is a reproductive psychiatrist and who should see that? What is reproductive we psychiatrist? We talked about in the, in the Francisca podcast, the, the person who was inter interviewed was uh, seeing a reproductive psychiatrist. Yeah, no, we're a rare breed. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're basically, we're psychiatrists. Um, training programs in reproductive psychiatry are really a very, very new phenomenon. They didn't exist when I was in training. There are people who are in sort of dedicated programs for training in reproductive psychiatry now, but they're very, very few and far between. Um, and, um, so many of us just, you know, have developed really an interest in the field and have done a lot of kind of independent research and have spent a lot of time working with those patients and, um, you know, and kind of have developed expertise sort of as a function, you know, as a function of that, um, I, you know, I, right now, um, I run a, uh, women's health psychopharmacology clinic where I have residents who are interested in that topic. Um, rotate with me and we see patients during pregnancy and postpartum with all sorts of psychiatric conditions. Um, I've actually had, you know, I've had fellows um, rotate with me. I've had child fellows rotate with me. I've had maternal fetal medicine fellows rotate with me, which is amazing. Um, it's, it's really like, it's an awesome opportunity for sort of a multiple, multiple, multidisciplinary approach. Right. That's amazing. So, I mean, I think the take home message would be for someone who has more complex mental health struggles that they might really benefit from seeing a reproductive psychiatrist. And if they couldn't access a reproductive psychiatrist, um, there is a, a hotline, right, that, that you're part of actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Plug no, that it's, right it's, now. <laughs> yeah, I'll advertise it. Yeah, so Postpartum Support International, which is a amazing, amazing mm -hmm. organization. Um, we, we have a helpline. I'm one of the people who staffs the helpline, um, where, you know, providers can make appointments, um, you know, a, a provider who's treating a pregnant woman, um, with a psychiatric condition and they don't feel like they have the expertise to, um, you know, to know what to do to, to, to help her, um, can call one of us, can make an appointment to call one of us on the helpline and sort of present the situation and we, we will advise them. It's only for providers. It's not for patients. Yeah. Um, postpartum, sorry, because postpartum support international also has a, a line for people to call who are correct. Yeah, yeah. postpartum support international has a ton of resources right. for women with all sorts of you know with all sorts of issues for 
for, um, but, but this, this particular helpline is for providers, you know, so that we can sort of extend our reach, right. um, you know, kind of beyond the patients that we, you know, that we see, we see ourselves because it is, you know, there is unfortunately a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of people who are really reluctant to treat pregnant women, you know, even in situations where it's warranted. Right. Because doctors have that same commission omission problem too. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I'm afraid to give this medication because what might happen if I give them medication? Right. And they have to understand what happens when you don't give the medication. Absolutely. So can we talk, I know we're supposed to be done. Can we talk for a few more minutes about the same issues, but in the postpartum period, say when a mom's nursing? Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. So again, really, you know, all the medications that we use to treat anxiety and depression are compatible with breastfeeding for the most part. Again, you know, with a caveat that the newer medications, we just don't have a lot of data on, so we just don't know. Um, but the older medications, um, you know, we feel very, very comfortable using pretty much all of them. There are some that produce really low levels in breast milk, and there are some that produce higher levels in breast milk. And so there are some doctors that will favor using the medications that produce lower levels in breast milk, which is, um, you know, which is fine in somebody who it has never been in treatment and is seeking treatment for the first time, and you don't really have anything else to guide your decision. But I would never, ever, ever switch from an effective medication to an unknown medication, especially right. in the postpartum period, right? The postpartum period is a period already where women are so, so vulnerable. And so it's sort of a perfect storm, right? Like this woman is already vulnerable. Um, and now we're switching to kind of this unknown medication because the doctor perceives it as being safer in breastfeeding, which is just not accurate. You know, there are medications that do produce higher levels in breast milk, um, but that's, that's not necessarily associated with any adverse outcomes that we see for the baby. So, you know, just because the level of medication is higher in breast milk doesn't mean the baby is any more likely to have problems from breastfeeding from a mom who's on, you know, that medication. Um, and, um, you know, again, I would really, you know, the, the safest medication is the one that's the most effective in most circumstances. Right. And breastfeeding is, is wonderful. I'm a pediatrician. I'm a big promoter of breastfeeding. Um, but even more important than breastfeeding is a healthy mom. Absolutely. And a well-fed baby with whatever you feed the baby with. Just Absolutely. Options, right? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yes. So yes. I think sometimes parents, that moms, they want so badly to breastfeed that they will go off their medication. Right. Which is, you know, unfortunate because really in most cases they don't need to like, right. again, for, for treatment of depression and anxiety, most of the medications we use are compatible with breastfeeding. Um, and, you know, when we do see any sorts of problems, which is very, very, very rare, they're very mild transient problems that, you know, are like jitteriness and maybe difficulty sleeping, that sort of thing that, are very difficult to distinguish from just like being a normal baby. Um, and, um, and certainly, you know, in a case where, you know, again, this is very, very, very rare. Most babies have absolutely no problems whatsoever with these medications, but, you know, in a rare case where a baby does have a mild issue, um, you know, it's, again, it's, it's transient. Um, and, you know, certainly, um, um, you know, um, levels of medication in breast milk are, are way, way, way lower than levels of medication that the baby gets, um, during pregnancy. So if the mom's on the same medication during pregnancy and postpartum, the baby is exposed to a much higher dose of the medication during pregnancy than they are through breast milk. Right. Well, this is really such good information and, you know, we could go on for another hour. We totally could. Good. I want to thank you so, so much for doing this with me. This is so helpful and so informative. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed being here. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, check out our Instagram at Joma underscore org. Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A.org, or email us at health at joma.org.